Hi everyone, this is Sheila. Thank you for joining us this morning and taking part in our online community. Whether you are from the local area, another state, or from around the world, we are the body of Christ and we join to worship Almighty God and bring Him honor. God bless and welcome to Church Online. Oh 
Because of your little faith, he told them, for I truly tell you, if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, you will tell this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move. Nothing will be impossible for you. And I will be reading Romans 8, 28. We know that all things work together for the good of those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. Thank you. We would like to thank you for your continued generosity and faithfulness in giving as we continue to worship God through our financial gifts. You can simply open the link to our Living Faith Church website. This will take you to our giving page, and from there you can give through PayPal, Givelify, or simply send a check or money order to Living Faith Church, P.O. Box 65, Exelon, Wisconsin, 54835. Join us on our Living Faith Church Exelon, Wisconsin Facebook page on Wednesday nights at 7 p.m. for our live stream study of the Signs of the Times, the Return of Jesus. Also, please continue to lift our president, leaders, and nation in prayer, as well as our LFC missions body in Tanzania, Africa, Mexico, India, Honduras, and Haiti. Please lift up the local body of Christ as well. Thanks, everyone. Faith. What is it? Being sure of our hope. Convinced of what we can't see. By faith, we understand the world was set in order at God's command. By faith, Abel offered God a greater sacrifice than Cain. And for his faith, God commended him as righteous. By faith, Noah trusted God and constructed an ark for the deliverance of his family. By faith, Abraham was willing to sacrifice Isaac, his only son, believing God would still fulfill his promises. By faith, Moses chose to be mistreated with the people of God rather than enjoy sin's fleeting pleasure. By faith, God's chosen nation crossed the Red Sea on dry ground and praised him as it swallowed up the Egyptians. By faith, Rahab the prostitute escaped destruction because she welcomed the spies in peace. Time will fail me if I tell of Gideon, David, and the prophets. By faith, they administered justice shut the mouths of lions, quenched raging fire. But others were imprisoned, murdered, and wandered in deserts, mountains, and openings in the earth. We are surrounded by this great cloud of witnesses. So get rid of every weight, of every sin, and run. Run with endurance the race set before us. Keep your eyes fixed on Jesus. He is the champion and guide of our faith. For promised joy, he endured the cross, thought nothing of its shame, and having risen again, has been handed his deserved glory at the right hand of the throne of God. Good morning. This is Pastor Tim from Living Faith Church in Exelon, Wisconsin. Again, it's so good to be with you this morning. Thank you for joining us. We've been on a series over the last few weeks called The Destiny of Nations. And before we get into our message this morning, would you please join me in prayer? Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you for the power of the Holy Spirit. We welcome you, Holy Spirit, and we invite you to come and take hold of this word with me. I pray this morning, Father, that as I bring forth this word, that it will flow out of my belly as streams of living water. Father, you said that the Holy Spirit was given to take the things of God, yea, the deep things of God, and make them known to us. Father, we thank you for supernatural divine revelation knowledge this morning. We thank you for ears to hear and eyes to see what you are saying to us by the Spirit of the living God. Again, we thank you that you put a treasure inside of us in an earthen vessel and that the excellence of the power is not of ourselves, but of Jesus Christ, who has made us able ministers of the good news. And we give you praise and honor and thanksgiving for it, and purpose not just to hear the word, 
but help us to be doers of the word in Jesus' name. And all the people of God said, Amen. So we've been on a series called The Destiny of Nations. Last week we ended by speaking about the nation of Uganda and how God turned the nation of Uganda around. But this morning I want to change directions just a little bit. We're going to come back to the nation of Uganda and some steps that God gave them supernaturally to pray for their nation and see things change. But I want to spend a moment this morning talking about discipling nations. You know, I believe that most believers in uh, the West or in the world in general certainly understand uh, the concept of going into all the world and preaching the gospel to every person. But I'm not so sure that we really understand much about making disciples of nations or even the concept of making disciples of nations. You know, because our emphasis for the most part over the years has been on our personal relationship with Christ and personal evangelism and personally sharing our faith and living as a personal witness of Jesus Christ, which of course is important. But since our emphasis has predominantly been on a personal level, I think we've missed the concept that God has called nations and called us to disciple nations. You know, in the book of Acts, chapter 17, verses 26 through 27, it says, And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on the face of the earth, having determined their appointed times and the boundaries of their lands and territories. This was so that they would seek God, if perhaps they might grasp for him, <clears throat> excuse me, and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. So again, God has a destiny not only for individuals, but God has a divine destiny and calling on nations. In Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 8, this says, When the Most High gave the nations their inheritance, when he separated the sons of men, he set the boundaries of the peoples according to the number of the sons of Israel. So praise be to God. God has a calling on nations, and nations... Are, are an integral part of the Word of God. God doesn't just speak to individuals. God speaks to nations. God sends prophets to nations. God warns nations. God uh, sets kings up. He brings kings down. So God is in the nation-building business. Again, when Jesus comes back to the earth, he will rule the nations. He's coming back and going to judge the nations. Uh, uh, Psalm chapter 2 says, Ask of me, and I will give you the nations for your inheritance. This, of course, is a messianic prophetic scripture referring (coughs) to Jesus as the King of all kings and the Lord of all lords. So in these scriptures, we certainly see that God is interested in nations. Um, You know, Jesus warned the nation of Israel and spoke to the nation of Israel about their missing the time of God's divine destiny and and, uh, visitation. You know, nations can be uh, called by God, but they can miss God's calling in their lives. And many nations of the world uh, are simply in apostasy uh, against the calling of God, or perhaps they've missed the divine call of God. I remember hearing Joseph Prince minister a message one time about uh, China, because Joseph Prince understands not only Hebrew, but the Chinese language. And uh, he was saying how that the Chinese language uh, has a very, very close similarity to the Hebrew language. It's a picturesque language. And he said, within the very letters of the Chinese language, we see the message of the flood and the message of creation. He said, China at one time had the divine DNA of God in its, uh, in its makeup. But of course, what happened to China? Uh, China was taken over by various religions, uh, influenced China, and then of course we see communism, and today China is a very uh, communistic nation. But he said this is one of the reasons uh, that it's so easy to win Chinese people to Christ. This is why the underground church in China is one of the greatest churches in the entire world, and uh, many, many, many Christians, millions upon millions of Christians in China in the underground church, because the Chinese people have within their makeup, their spiritual makeup, the DNA of God. I've uh, heard missionaries minister about different countries that had been under very totalitarianistic, uh, communistic rule for, for, for years. I remember uh, Brother Lester Sumrall who went into Albania, and Albania had been ruled by a very demonic uh, oppressive communistic ruler 
And he said when he went into Albania after it had opened its doors to the gospel and began to preach, he said it seemed like the people had no concept of believing in God. The, he said I'd never been in a nation that was so, so destitute of faith. It just seemed like the people just couldn't grasp the concept of faith because it had been stripped out of them over the years because of what had been proclaimed to them through communism. Uh, and so we see that nations are called by God, but nations can miss the calling of God in their timing. And if a nation misses the call of God and the timing of God, that call, that timing of God will not come back to that nation again for a very long time. Uh, it's reported that after the bombing of Japan in World War II that, that uh, um, General MacArthur, uh, McCarthy said that uh, he wanted to uh, he called for missionaries to come into uh, Japan, and he said, if you will give me a, a lot of missionaries, we will win Japan to Christ. And, of course, the church was not really prepared, and it did answer the call, and it did not send missionaries to Japan. And as a result, Japan is one of the most difficult nations on the planet to reach people with the gospel. So nations of the world have a divine destiny, but if God's people don't answer the call to reach those nations at a particular time, the door and window of opportunity can be closed, and then some other thing will come in, some other belief. Uh, it will, will tr transform that nation into something other than what God wanted it to be. We know that God spoke to the nation of Israel. God called Abraham out of Ur over the Chaldean, and he said, I'm going to make of you a great people. And he said, through you, all nations, not people, but all nations of the world shall be blessed. And, of course, what happens? Abraham uh, has Isaac, Isaac has Jacob, and out of the loins of Jacob, Jacob is, uh, his name is changed to Israel. Israel has the 12 patriarchs, and that becomes the nation of Israel. So God has a divine call on the nation of Israel. God is in the nation-building business. But if a nation does not recognize its calling and the timing of God, it can miss God's purposes, just like an individual can. And we know that God spoke to the nation of Israel and called them, and Jesus rebuked the nation of Israel when he was on the earth ministering because they did not recognize the time of their visitation. In Matthew's Gospel, the 16th chapter, the tw second and through the fourth verse says, He answered and said to them, When it is evening, you say it will be fair weather, for the sky is red, and in the morning it will be foul weather, for the sky is red and threatening. Hypocrites! You know how to discern the face of the sky, but you cannot discern the signs of the times. A wicked and adulterous generation seeks after a sign, and no sign shall be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. And he left them and departed. So Jesus rebukes the leaders of Israel because they had no discernment of the time of God's visitation, but they, were, they missed the calling of God. In Luke's Gospel, the 19th chapter, verses 43 through 44, it says, For days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embarkment, uh, an embarkment around you, surround you, and close you in on every side, and level you and your children within you to the ground. And they will not leave in you one stone upon another. And look at what he says here. Because you did not know the time of of your visitation. So because Israel missed the time of their visitation and should have recognized Messiah and should have embraced him as Messiah, uh, the leadership of Israel especially, <clears throat> but because they missed that and renounced Jesus as Messiah in their leadership, um, what happened? Well, judgment came upon the nation and Jesus warned them because you missed the time of your visitation, you're going to face great hardship and judgment is going to come into this nation. So it was through the nation of Israel that God had a divine destiny to reach the other nations of the world. But we know that also Israel at times in their history failed to recognize the time of the visitation. And when a nation doesn't recognize the time of God's visitation, what happens? That visitation, that window, and that door closes. Remember, Jesus said in Revelation, he said, Behold, I set before your door, uh, an open door that no man can close. So, praise be to God. God can open doors and God can close doors. And when a nation is not reached with the gospel and when a nation does not respond to the gospel, then that call will leave that nation and that call will not come around for some time in their history. 
So uh, we know that n the nation of Israel failed that test. We find an interesting example of, of a generation, that first generation that came out of Egypt with Moses, that they were called to a divine destiny. God wanted to take them into the promised land, and God wanted to establish the nation in the land of Canaan and set them as a, a, a light to the world in, in uh, the land that God had promised to Abraham. But what happens? Uh, they come to the promised land. They send in the 12 spies. Ten come back with an evil report, and only Joshua and Caleb had a good report of the land. So the ten people, ten men, turned the entire nation through their unbelief and, and fear-filled words, corrupted and turned the entire nation away from God and his plan and purposes in the nation. And that entire generation except for those under 20 years old, <clears throat> and Joshua and Caleb, and of course, um, never, th that entire generation was judged and lost their inheritance and lost their opportunity to go in and possess the land. You know, I just want to warn you, <clears throat> in America today, uh, we have a thing called the coronavirus, and, and granted, we should take precaution, but do not let your heart be filled with fear, because fear can keep you from the destiny of God. Many people in this country and around the world today are gripped with fear. Uh, there are greater things to fear in this world than, than what we're facing today. And fear is not something we should give heed to because fear can rob you of your God-ordained destiny. The enemy can use fear to turn nations away from his purposes and manipulate people into bondage and darkness. And we must not allow that to happen in this hour. But it tells us in Numbers chapter 14, when this generation came to the promised land, and, uh, of course, they didn't go in, and they, they uh, refused to obey God, and they refused to heed, and the whole generation, that whole, the whole nation, the whole people lifted up their voices at the words of these unbelievers, at these words of these uh, fear-mongering uh, people, and they lifted up their voices and wailed and wept, and they threatened to stone Moses and Joshua and Caleb, and then God appeared and God rebukes them, and God is going to wipe them out. Judgment comes because God shows up in the middle of their unbelief, and God has had it because he's given them opportunity after opportunity after opportunity, and every single time they've failed. And then Moses, as a type of Christ, stands between God and the people, <clears throat> and Moses uh, intercedes for the people, and God hears what Moses says, and God does not judge the people. But God's judgment does come upon those ten spies who brought up an evil report. And they are struck and they die. But we also find that when this happens, the people suddenly have a change of heart. The next day they, they come to Moses and say, well, we're going to go in and take the land. We, we sinned against God and now we want to go up and possess the land. We'll, we'll obey God now. But what does God say? God through Moses says no. This God is not with you, and the ark is not going to go with you, and God will not be with you, and you will be routed, and you will fail, and the people won't listen, and they go up in their own understanding and their own strength, and what happens? They are slaughtered. They run, out, they run from their enemies, and God does not deliver their enemies into their hand because they op operate in presumption. And we see in this, this, um, this particular incident a great lesson about not only trusting God, believing God, but we also see a great lesson in the power of unbelief and fear and how uh, we can be robbed of our divine destiny. The entire nation can be robbed of its divine destiny by simply a few people who allow, are allowed to influence them in a negative way and in fear. So we have to be very careful about who we are heeding and who we are listening to because it can affect the entire nation. So once a door closes in a nation, that door will not open for some time. And so we see that Moses warned the children of Israel, and they mourned and they wept, but they would not listen. And uh, as a result, they lost out on their inheritance. That entire generation died in the wilderness. And it wasn't until a new generation under Joshua that they were able to go in and possess the land. In the Gospel of, of Matthew chapter 25, we have the story of what we commonly call the parable of the sheep and goats the story of the sheep and goats. And the Bible says, 
when the Son of Man, in verse 31, when the Son of Man comes in His glory and all His holy angels with Him, then He will sit on the throne of His glory. All the nations will be gathered before Him, and He will separate them one from another as a shepherd divides his sheep from his goats. And, and so we go on and we see that Jesus said to the one on the right, I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. And I was thirst, and I was in prison, and you visited me, and so on and so forth. And those on his left, he said, "I was hungry, and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink, and so on and so forth." And he brings judgment upon those on his left who did not help his people. But what we want to really see about this particular passage is that when Jesus returns, he's going to gather the nations before him, and he is going to bring. Uh, allow those nations, those Gentile or non-believing nations who did not follow after him, but yet has a divine destiny. He's going to allow those who, who blessed his people, who did not persecute the believer or the Jewish believer. He's going to bless his people, those people who, who uh, helped his people against the Antichrist. He's going to bless them and allow them into the millennial reign of his kingdom. But those who did not, those nations who did not, he will cast them out and he will literally destroy those nations at his return. So here we see that God, when Jesus returns, he's going to deal with nations. Again, I've said this before, when Jesus comes to rule and reign on this earth, when he sets up his millennial reign, his 1,000 year reign, he is going to rule over the nations, and we are going to rule the nations with him. So nations will not disappear from the planet when Jesus returns. He's not going to wave some magic Messiah, messianic wand, and everything's going to disappear and the nations are going to be gone. No, Jesus will still deal with nations. As a matter of fact, the Bible says that he will require the nations to come up and worship, uh, worship in Israel, in Jerusalem, during the Feast of Tabernacles at that time. So God is in the nation business, and God has a destiny for nations and a divine purpose for nations, but nations must heed the call. So we, as God's people, we have to broaden our, our concept and broaden our scope and recognize that we're not just called to reach people, we're, reach, we're called to reach nations. So let me, let me just make some clarity here. You know, when we reach individuals, which we're called to do, and that's what we're called to reach individuals, we're called to, to preach the gospel as individuals to our neighbors and our friends. But I also believe that we're called to impact nations. You see, when we reach an individual, we change their life, and we might change their family life, family's life, but I believe the gospel, God's intention was that the church have a broader impact. You know, Western civilization was birthed and came uh, about because of, uh, it was Christianity that saved Europe from the pagan cesspool that it was. And it was Christianity that formed the European continent. And it was Christianity that formed the United States of America. Our, our laws and institutions, our form of government was founded upon biblical uh, the biblical foundations of Scripture. And uh, it is because of that that our Constitution has lasted longer, far longer than any Constitution in history. And um, it is because of that that America was so blessed as a nation. We also have to recognize that, that the Christian ethos or the Christian influence is what drove the culture of the West for many, many generations. If you look back at European history, you'll see that uh, all art and so on and so forth was was predominantly in the church. It was the church that uh, all our art was predominantly sacred. And then, of course, we had the Enlightenment that came along and art became secular and the world became more secularized. And we see this transformation from Christianity being the driving ethos of the nation where man's humanistic mor morality and, and uh, atheistic ideas begin to drive culture. And, of course, we've seen that in our own nation, especially since the, the you know, 70s and 60s and 70s. We've seen an acceleration. It went back long before that where we saw this divide starting to happen in the United States. And today we're looking at a nation where, unfortunately, it seems as though Christianity has taken a back seat to driving culture anymore. 
And uh, this, this is one of the reasons why we're seeing so much wickedness in our nation. We're seeing so much uh, bloodshed. We're seeing so much violence. We're seeing all of these things because of the lack of godliness in our nation. And, uh, but what we recognize and have to realize is that God has called us to impact and transform culture. We see examples of this throughout history. We certainly see examples of this in the book of Ephesians, the letter to the Ephesians. Uh, in uh, chapter 6, verse 10, the apostle Paul said, A final word, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the, all of God's armor so that you will be able to stand firm against all the strategies of the devil. For we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world against mighty powers in this dark world and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. And see, the, the church at Ephesus certainly was a, a church that transformed culture. There was a mighty revival that took place in Ephesus where people began, the city of Ephesus, where people began to burn their magical books and renounce the pagan gods and turn away from the pagan idols of Diana and they began to serve God. So the, so the very nature of the gospel not only transformed individuals, but it literally began to transform the culture, so much so that it began to have a negative impact upon the silver, uh, the idol makers who were making idols, and they had their livelihood from this, and they caused a great, revi- uh, excuse me, a great riot in the city because they were losing so much money because Christians were no longer buying pagan idols. But we also see that Paul said that when a nation, he says, our fight is not with flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, and the rulers of the darkness of this age. So what we're saying here is that when a nation is not following after God, then what happens? The nation begins to be influenced by demonic forces in the heavenly realms, unseen forces of darkness that begin to lead the nation into bondage and even greater darkness and see it is only the gospel and it's only the power of God that can break that stronghold over the land. And so we see nations that at one time had an opportunity to hear the gospel, but because they missed that opportunity or they missed the the window or the door that was open to them, uh, that passed them by and they fell into gross darkness and idolatry and every sort of ungodly wickedness under the sun. And we certainly see that with the nation of Israel again. There were times in Israel's history where they fell into apostasy and God warned them and said, you have become worse than the nations I drove out before you. And God, of course, warned them about what would happen if they refused to follow. And and so what happens when a nation or people uh, fall away from God, then they face the consequences of it. So we might ask ourselves, well, what exactly constitutes a nation? What are some of the characteristics of a nation beyond what we see, you know, well, this is the United States, this is Great Britain, and so on and so forth. But there are a number of characteristics of nations. But So one of the common things you see in nations is they have a, a general common, common uh, language. Uh, we also see that a nation is a people group with a common identity or a common destiny. So there's something about that nation or that people group that that they have a commonality. So when they meet people even from other parts of the country, when they're traveling and they meet somebody from their homeland, there's a commonality there that binds them together. Uh, you know, we see this with uh, the Asian culture. There, we see this with the Hispanic culture. We see it with Scandinavian culture. So there's definitely a distinction in ethnicity and a distinction in culture. I mean, we even see this in the United States of America. In, in different regions of the United States. There's a different mindset in the Midwest than there is in people on the East or, or West Coast. There's just a different way of looking at life because we come from different ethnic backgrounds for the most part. And so, so different regions are known for different ethnicity and different culture and different things. So when we meet people from those regions, you know, if you're uh, a Midwesterner and you meet somebody out in California, you meet somebody in, in New York City, uh, there's still going to be that kind of Midwestern understanding because you, you grasp the culture, you grasp the, the commonality. And this is why language is so important. It's, it's the common language in a nation that is one of the most important uh, strengthening factors in that nation staying strong. 
our, our dear brothers and sisters in Tanzania, Africa. One of the reasons Tanzania has been a very strong nation and has had less tribalism than many other nations and less inward fighting is because when they gained their independence uh, in the 60s, their president, who was very wise, uh, officially made uh, Swahili their national language. And so when you talk to people in Tanzania, bless their hearts, uh, it's so encouraging because they'll say, you know, we don't recognize ourselves by our tribe. We recognize ourselves by, our, by the fact we're, we're Tanzanians. We, are, we, we speak Swahili. And they're very proud of that, and they should be, just as we in the United States should be proud we speak English. Uh, it's, it's a commonality that binds us together, and it's that common language that binds the people of Tanzania together. Now, there are other nations in Africa where they don't have that common language, and when people cannot communicate with each other with a common language, it ca causes great problems, and there can be great uh, misunderstanding simply because they don't have that common language. Uh, another thing about nations, one of the most common characteristics is nations have blood relationships or common ethnicity. There's something about the commonality of their ethnicity that binds them together. And of course, the other thing is there is territory or boundaries. Uh, this is why it's important that nations have boundaries. Uh, this is why it's important nations have borders. A lot of people in the United States right now can't seem to understand that borders are important. You know, people think, well, what do we need borders for? Let's get rid of borders. Well, if you get rid of borders, you no longer have a nation. It's borders and boundaries that distinct, make nations distinct. You know, for instance, uh, here in the state of Wisconsin, if you talk to people from Wisconsin, what do we recognize the state of Wisconsin? We're called the Indian Head State. And we're called the Indian, Indian Head State not only because the fact that we're many Native and are still many uh, First People or Native American peoples here, but also because the state itself and its borders looks like an Indian head. And there are definite distinct things about states. And, uh, you know, we are proud of our state and we like certain things about our state. And uh, there's even a commonality among states. Uh, you know, Minnesotans, uh, Minnesotan nice, uh, Wisconsin, cheese. Different states have common things that bind them together. And so the United States is much like uh, a, a nation with different... Uh, almost like little nations within itself uh, that join into one nation. But it's one nation under God, and that's what our founders based this nation upon, and it was the one nation under God concept that bound the United States together, that out, e pluribus unum, out of many, one. And so this is one of the things that binds people groups, ethnicities, and, and makes up nations the most common things about nations. So when nations fail to follow God's destiny, when nations fall away from God or ignore God or fall into great sin or won't follow after God's will, then what does God do? Well, God sends shakings into those nations. God will allow their economies to be shaken. God will allow natural disasters. God will allow trouble into the nation. And what's God's purpose in that? Because he hates people? No, his purpose is he's trying to wake the nation up. He's trying to get their attention. He's trying to get them to turn from their sin and turn to God. And, of course, the nation can go in a couple of different ways. The nation can either repent and turn to Christ and wake up and look up, or the nation can become even more rebellious and more stubborn and more arrogant. We see this in the book of Revelation when the judgments of God begin to come upon the Antichrist kingdom and upon the nations of the world, the book of Revelation the Bible says that even though they knew that they should, uh, the people didn't repent, but they shook their fist at the God of heaven and they cursed God. And we see that, of course, it's very unfortunate that we're seeing a lot of that in the United States right now where we have, we have segments of people that are blasphemistic against God and they hate God and they openly defy God and they don't want anything to do with God. And uh, the Bible says in, in Romans chapter 1, when they knew God, they didn't glorify him as God, nor were they thankful, but instead their evil hearts, their hearts became foolish, and they changed, and be, instead of becoming, uh, turning to God, they became utter fools. And so God turned them over to a reprobate mind. So even in Romans chapter 1, the Apostle Paul gives us an example of this, how that God reaches out to the nations 
But if a nation or a people continue to refuse and reject God, then God will eventually turn them over to their, their passions and desires and sin, and they will begin to reap the consequence, and it will not be a pleasant experience. Uh, amen. Uh, the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 12 that when God spoke from Mount Zion, his voice shook the earth, but now he makes another promise. Once again, I will shake not only the earth, but the heavens also. This means that all of creation will be shaken and removed so that only unshakable things will remain. Since we are receiving a kingdom that is unshakable, let us be thankful and please God by worshiping him with holy fear and awe. So what does this mean? God is shaking the world, and we're seeing the world shaking right now. We're seeing nations transform. We're seeing nations shaking uh, right now with what's happening in the economy and what's happening with the coronavirus and what's going on. There is a great shifting taking place in the nations, and this shifting has been going on for some time now, and we are seeing things changing at ever-increasing rapid rates. And the world in which we live uh, is quickly being transformed into something that is not only dangerous, more dangerous, but it also is a transformation that is beginning to shake people to their very core. And so people can be filled with fear or they can be filled with faith. And what God is trying to do to the nations is wake them up from their slumber, wake them up from their pagan idolatry, wake them up from their love of self and all of the things that consume people and consume nations and turn them back to him. And, and these shakings are going to continue because God is trying to shake the nations to get them to wake up from their slumber. So... We know that God had a calling, a divine call upon the nation of Israel, and that God has a divine calling on the nations of the world, and that God has called the church to disciple the nations. Remember, Jesus said, go into all the world and make disciples of all nations. So again, God has called us to be disciple makers, not only of individuals, but to disciple the nations. And we may look at that and say, well, I have no idea as to how to disciple nations. Well, this is why the church needs the power of God, the transforming power of God, because we cannot transform society without God's power. Now, it's an unfortunate thing. It's an unfortunate thing that in this hour that the church is called to be salt and light. The church in the West, in many respects, is not being salt and light. In an attempt to be relevant to the culture, in an attempt to reach the culture, it's an unfortunate thing that the church, instead of trusting in the power of God and seeking the power of God, sought after the cunning craftiness and in wisdom of men. And by this, I simply mean that by trying to be relevant to the culture, the church has become even less relevant. When we have churches and ministers who are not proclaiming the power of the gospel, when we have churches who are dumbing down the gospel and dumbing down the truth and refusing to proclaim the truth in the middle of darkness, this is not being salt and light. This is being trampled underfoot. Jesus said if the salt loses its flavor, it loses its saltiness, it is good for nothing to be, be trampled underfoot foot of men. You know, the church has had the greatest impact upon the cultures when it has been the least like the culture. So I understand, as Paul said, we want to become all things to all men that we by some means might win them to Christ. Paul never intended that the church stop proclaiming the uncompromising gospel of Jesus Christ. And we must continue to preach Christ in him crucified. It is the gospel of Christ that turns men to salvation. And a lot of what we hear preached today is nothing like the gospel. It is a man-centered, yeah, egocentric type of gospel that is asking lost people what they think about being saved. And the Bible says without repentance, there is no salvation. So we must, as the church, go back to the power of God. Paul said, when I came to you, I didn't come with the enticing words of men's wisdom, but my gospel was with the power and demonstration of the Holy Spirit. So praise be to God. You know, when Jesus gave us what we commonly call the Lord's Prayer, which more effectively, more appropriately should be called the disciples' prayer, because it was the disciples that asked Jesus, teach us to pray. And when Jesus gave us that prayer, he said, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your name be kept holy. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. 
So in that prayer, what is Jesus saying? What we need is God's kingdom to come because the kingdom of God, when it comes into the earth, that means the king of the kingdom is going to manifest in the earth. And what we really need is God's kingdom to come and will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. Because if God's will comes into the earth and his kingdom comes into the earth, he's going to transform nations. He's going to transform leaders. He's going to transform the very climate and atmosphere of the nation, not just individuals. So God wants nations and the very atmosphere of those nations and the very uh, the governments of those nations uh, and the very uh, culture of that nation to be transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit and by the power of the Word of God, not just individuals. See, again, if we only reach individuals, we're not going to transform the culture. When we reach the culture by transforming enough, of course, we need to reach individuals, but when the very nation and the very climate of the nation is transformed by the power and presence of God, then the nation transforms. And of course, as I said last week, Uganda and many nations are examples of this uh, throughout history. The United States of America has been transformed on a number of occasions by great awakenings and the power of God that shook our nation and transformed the very climate and very culture of this nation and uh, into what it is and had become this great, great nation. So we as a body of Christ has re have reached our hour of decision. We have reached a point in our world where we must seek the power and presence of God as never before and call upon the Lord to come and turn this nation away from its sin. You know, God said to Ezekiel, I look for a man. I look for someone to stand in the gap and make up the hedge so I would not destroy the nation. But I found no one. So God is first and foremost looking for people to stand between him and the judge, the, the nation, so that the sin of the nation that's coming up before him does not bring his judgment upon the nation. And of course, we see in Second Chronicles, if my people, chapter 7, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and turn from their sin and seek my face, then I will hear from heaven, I will forgive their sin and heal their land. Os Guinness, one of my favorite uh, British authors, said, it is apparent that the world is changing in an unprecedented manner. Friedrich Nietzsche predicted that secular people losing touch with transcendence would eventually lose a reference point from which to look down and judge themselves. In the end, they would lose even the capacity to despise themselves. Thus, because of the death of God, they would confuse heaven with happiness and happiness with health. So Nietzsche, who coined the phrase, God is dead, believed that because man had killed God or killed the concept of God, that humanity would spiral into meaninglessness, that humanity would spiral into a society where nothing made any uh, absolute sense whatsoever. And of course, we're seeing this in our culture today because it's only the presence and purposes of God that gives life ultimate meaning. If there is no God, if there's no ultimate meaning beyond this grave, then we of all people, as Paul said, are most miserable. I want to conclude this morning by reading a, couple, a quote by one of my favorite Christian thinkers and authors, and of course this is the late, great Francis Schaeffer, or we should say just the late Francis Schaeffer, in his book, The Great Evangelical Disaster, one of my favorite <clears throat> books by Francis Schaeffer. And he said, we need a radical and revolutionary message. No message is more radical or revolutionary than that which stands in direct opposition to the world spirit of our age. The Bible answers for us all of our deepest questions, questions of purpose, origin, history, morality, society, society, sociologically and spiritually. It gives context for the search for truth and touches upon all uh, of reality. Unfortunately, evangelical accommodation has been all one way. The culture has not accommodated at all. It continues its slide into moral relativism in its logical conclusion. We need a new generation of evangelicals who are willing to stand against the culture to take a truly radical position and proclaim the truth of God's word. More than this, they must be willing to stand against those within the church who would silence the Christian voice through compromise. They must firmly and lovingly reject such accommodation, confront those in error, and oppose such falsehood within the church, 
and the culture, end quote. Amen. And fi finally, our John R. Mott, who said, the invasion of the church by the world is a menace to the extension of Christ's kingdom in all ages. Conformity to the world by Christians has resulted in a lack of spiritual life and a consequent lack of spiritual vision and enterprise. A secularized, secularized or self-centered church can never evangelize the world. So we'll wrap it up there this morning. I believe, it, pray that you, uh, this message goes deep into your, the soil of your heart and you recognize that we are called to something greater than ourselves. We are called to the nations. And we call out and we have a grander vision. I pray that God put the nations within your heart and that you begin seeing that you are more important and the destiny and calling of the body of Christ is more than simply our family, our church, and in our community, it's the nations of the world. It's, we're called to the nations. We're called to reach the nations. And I pray that you will join in that quest. So this morning, I pray uh, that if you are not a believer, that you would surrender your heart to Christ. I, I just urge you as a Christian to consecrate your life to God. I want to pray with you as we close this morning. Pray that the power of the Holy Spirit would burn this message into the soul of your heart that it would go deep down into the soil. You say, I don't really comprehend what you're saying here, Pastor Tim. Well, I pray that the, as I proclaim this truth, proclaim these words, that you would take hold of the Word of God and it would be life and uh, health to your spirit in Jesus' holy name. So pray with me this morning. Heavenly Father, I thank you and praise you today that as we've heard the Word of God, I pray that it go deep into the soil of the hearts of the hearer. And it will not be stolen by the devil. It will not be snatched away. Lord, I pray for divine revelation today. I pray that you'd open the eyes of their understanding. I pray that you'll give them supernatural divine discernment this morning. So that the words that they've heard, even though their mind may not completely comprehend it, that it will be meat to their spirit. That their spirit will take hold of the truth of these words. And that it will burn within them, Father, like a fire shut up in their bones. Father, that when they sleep in the night, you will give them supernatural divine revelation, supernatural divine vision. The Father, the destiny of the nations and the destiny of their life within that nation, the nations. Father, we pray that you would rise, raise up those in this hour to be warriors for the kingdom, to be mighty men and women of God who will not be satisfied with simply their family and their community and their church and their country, but they must be firebrands to the nations. Father, men who uh, will turn whole nations around, will transform uh, the very culture because of the Holy Spirit within them. Father God, we rejoice in you this morning. We praise you and bless you, and we give you all the praise and the honor for it in Jesus' name. Well, thank you again for joining us today. Please uh, contact us if you have any questions via our, our website that's listed on the description of this video. And again, may the Lord bless you and keep you, keep you. May the Lord be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and grant you his peace. In Jesus' holy name, God bless you. Bye-bye.